Introducing health and wellness advocate, veteran international real estate investment expert, author and speaker, Adiel Gurel. Health tips, fitness tips, nutrition and well-being, world-class experts, all right here on my podcast, The Adiel Gurel Show. Hi, everyone. We are very fortunate to have a, you know, with us today, Dr. John Beaulieu. John Beaulieu, you know, MD, a PhD, is one of the foremost philosophers and major, major innovators in the area of sound healing therapies. A world-renowned speaker, composer, a pianist, and naturopathic doctor, you know, Dr. Bollier has pioneered a technique called biosonic repatterning, a natural method of healing and consciousness development using tuning forks you know, and other sound modalities based on the sonic ratios inherent in nature. As the founder of Biosonic Enterprises, he has developed and distributed over 50 different sound healing related products, including tuning forks, instructional videos, audio programs, CDs, and books. Dr. Bollier is the groundbreaking author of music and sound in the healing arts and the composer and producer of Calendula, a suite for the Pythagorean, sorry, a suite for Pythagorean tuning forks. I got a little bit uh, stuck in there, a CD, you know, designed to physically align your body and create a deep, relaxed state of awareness. He lectures and performs worldwide and conducts training seminars for practitioners in the healing arts. So, Dr. Bollier, it's really a pleasure, you know, to have you online with us here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to take the liberty to call you John, if that's okay. I prefer it. <laughs> Very good. So if you can tell us right from the very beginning, what is sound healing and how did you get involved in sound healing? Well, sound healing is basically it's the use of sound uh, to bring us back into an aligned state in which our body uh, can take care of itself, our own natural immune system or uh, can kick in correctly. And we have research showing how this happens. Uh, so that we now become naturally stronger. Uh, we, I like to say we become in tune. And when we're in tune, uh, athletes would say they were in the zone. Uh, we would say uh, we're centered. Uh, we could say we're, we have everything together in order to face the challenges of life. Uh, so sound healing is essentially a way, uh, one way, actually one way of many that should be integrated that assist us in getting in tune. Uh, and I came into the field of sound healing actually unconsciously very early, uh, of course, playing you know the piano as a, as a three-year-old uh, and then developing my, eventually, first my sound skills, then my music skills. Uh, but I came into the healing arts through psychology. Uh, I went to a psychiatric hospital uh, and did it, and I fell in love with the psychiatric patients basically as during a, a field trip. And I eventually got my degrees uh, in psychology and counseling. Uh, I have a doctorate in those fields. That was my first field, and along with that, I took a master's degree in piano performance. So in those days, you could actually integrate them together. Uh, people went to school that way. <laughs> I don't know now, but in those days it was possible because this was in the early 1970s, late 60s. Um, and when I, I wound up uh, in 1973 in New York City, I, came, I went there actually to study uh, and play music with John Cage and avant garde performers. Um, and also, I was fortunate enough to get a job at Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital as a therapist and researcher, uh, which is a premier hospital uh, around the world. So I wound up with the best of everything in 1973 when I arrived in New York City. 
And then when I was at the hospital, I also had a laboratory at New York University because I was hired by NYU. And in that laboratory, there was a, a little room, uh, and that little room was called an anechoic chamber. And I later learned, I didn't know at the time, but an anechoic chamber, is, it's, I, I knew this at the time, it's a chamber for you sit in and it's totally dark and totally silent. So when you go in there, it's like a sensory deprivation chamber designed by engineers. And so when I was in, I used to go in there for first a few minutes and for hours at a time listening to the sounds of my body. And only later did I discover that room was put there by the CIA in the 1950s for, for psychological interrogation experiments. I, I said to my, I learned that 10 years later. So. And I didn't know about SAGE at the time. Had I known, I would have cleaned it out more. But, but sure enough, it was actually in my lab uh, and, I, and I got to use it. It was just one of those, again, wonderful synchronistic things that for, for me to support the field to integrate and come into the field of sound healing. But when I was in there listening, I get a bass line of the sounds of my body. And I really liked this high pitched sound I could hear in my head. It's called, it's the sound of your nervous system in operation, your central nervous system, and also uh, sympathetic. And one day I had an argument in New York City with somebody in a, a subway booth, uh, so, and, I, and I didn't realize how much it affected me. And when I got back into the anechoic chamber, I closed my eyes and I could hear the sound was like, like this grinding like this. And I didn't even know it. I mean, I had the bass line of like, I meditated in the chamber, all of a sudden, screaming in my head. And I said, oh my gosh, like, I wasn't even aware of how much this, what would this do to me if I didn't, become aware of it. You know, people walk around all day in New York angry, so <laughs> I figured <laughs> I have, this has to be affecting me physically. I could hear it in my nervous system. And I sat there and all of a sudden I got this insight that I could tune my nervous system like a string. And I, because I had the musical training, I had the training to, in meditation and yoga to be quiet in the chamber. I had the research training to do what we call phenomenological research. All three were coming together and an intuitive insight came that I could be, I could tune myself. And again, I was so fortunate, I ran downstairs and there was a music store right, at, right in Washington Square, right at the university. I said, I knew what tuning forks I wanted based on my music training. I ran upstairs with two tuning forks, something like this, right? and I. Tapped them, held them into my ears. You can hear it, maybe it'll come like so. You can hear it, yeah. Mm. Only near, your, near your ears. Yeah, I held them like this, right? But I didn't tap them together. I tapped them on my knees, because otherwise, like so. Mm. I like this. My nervous system goes. Mm. It, it, oh. it trained immediately. I mean, it was like this to the sound of the tuning forks. Wow. And I felt a wave come over me. I don't have just a wave. Uh, and I just felt my, my shoulders, I didn't know they were like this, but they must, they felt everything go like this. And it's just like literally being at the ocean and a wave washes over you, but a wave of sound. I like to, today, I think it's a wave of consciousness, you know, and, uh, Right then and there, I just had such a deep, profound experience, phenomenologically, that that began my interest really in the use of sound for healing. Not music, I've been doing music therapy already, but now all of a sudden I had pure sound. You know, and it was how could I use it? I saw what it did for me, um, you know, and thus began my journey. That was 1973. So when you ran down to Washington Square to get, you know, the tuning right. front, Obviously, you were leaning on your musical background, but still, what made you pick those forks? Well, I knew my composition teacher was a Greek composer, one of the greatest composers of the 20th century named Ionis Zanakis. And that, you get, this man 
had was an architect and an engineer, great mathematician, and even to study with him, you needed advanced calculus and so on, just to get into his composition, music composition classes. And so I had to learn a lot of math, a lot of ratios and things like that, but also how music was organized mathematically. Uh, and this was pretty amazing, like in 1968, you know, 69. Uh, so I had to learn that with him. But this guy was even more crazy because he was trained as an architect and engineer, and in World War II, the Nazis had, you know, pretty, he had a big scar down his face. He was a guerrilla fighter for Greece. And he, is, he, was, he would tell stories about World War II while he was teaching music. And his main story was that he was in the hospital recuperating from the Nazis having shot him and cut him. Uh, and he had a vision that he was in ancient Greece and he was a music composer. Uh, and he woke up from his vision and went out of the hospital. And when the war ended, he went to Paris and met Nala Bougier, Bougier and said, I'm a composer. She said, no, you're an architect. He says, no, I'm a composer. <laughs> she says, what do you know about music? He says, nothing. <laughs> and he says, but I had this vision. And she says, I'll take you. You're my student. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and she says, what you need to do is focus on mathematics because that's what you know best. And I'll teach you music, how to compose. He didn't play any instruments, nothing. So his teaching gave you 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 knew what frequencies yes. you're looking for. Yes, I knew exactly what I wanted. It was basically we'd say in modern uh, C and G. Uh, it's a special interval. It's a, uh, if I had the two tuning forks, if you look at them like so, uh, one smaller, one's larger. One sound is lower. One sound is higher. So you figure there's a space between them. That space is called an interval, and it has a na it, It's actually there's numbers on the tuning forks, uh, and if you put those numbers together, they make what's called a ratio. And that ratio in ancient Greece was the most sacred of sacred sounds. In India, it was also in ancient times the perfect dance of Shiva and Shakti. And in, in China, it's the perfect balance of yin and yang, This these two sounds. I knew this going in. That's why I wanted them. Uh, and I knew it, the Pythagorean part from Xenakis because he was very much into Greek mythology. So I said, there's, let me, I just knew it. it and it's, again, it was intuitive, but based on knowledge that I put together unconsciously. Uh, and sure enough, that was my basic introduction to the use of tuning forks for healing. But I don't want to skim over something that you said, which I think is major. You had an insight. That insight is very big. It's a big thing. There's still a distance between your fight with that person outside, your nervous system being all rattled, you being in the you know anechoic chamber, and yet there is the mental leap there that you made. I <laughs> want you know that's very important. Yeah. Well, in fact, there's you know we use the word intuition is not something we're taught in school that kind of insight, uh, and yet the science on it today, especially, is just amazing, you know, that how important it is to quantify something and have intuition, you know, they work together like a teeter-totter, you know, and uh, a lot of my work involves both, can you quantify sound, can you research it, and can you qualify it, can you intuify it, so to speak, because both together really are what integrates inside of us. So I had that insight, but that insight again came from a lot of material I already knew, but something inside of me at that moment, and perhaps as we would say from the research, going to other dimensions, going to places I could not conceive of in a normal way, maybe to the future, who knows, because it seems we could do that. Uh, I put it together and brought it forward and it burst inside of me. That's, that, that would be called intuition. Yeah, but I, I'm appreciating that you have that moment of intuition because now we can all benefit from it. So I just want to say, but I have a question for you. You are holding the two forks. One of them is bigger, lower sound. One of them is smaller, with the higher sound. And let's say the frequency of this one is X. The frequency of this one is Y. X minus Y. Let's call it Delta. Would it be better to have X and Y here or just get a tuning fork 
at the delta frequency? Well, you could do either way, depending upon your delta frequency tuning fork, uh, based on what we call overtones or harmonics in the sound. So a lot of times people think of tuning forks as a specific frequency, but actually this tuning fork, when you, if I play it like this, you can hear the overtones. In other words, even though it's two forks, there's over, over 120 different sounds related to each other when I tap them together. And always, if I tap it like this, it's one tone, but the next overtone is C and G, right? So it's everywhere in the sound. So therefore, I could even have, I could take this tuning fork or take one that looks like this, where I put weights on it. Oops. I put weights on it. I could press it to the body, and it looks like a single tone. That's called the primary tone of the fundamental, but it also is making it a C and G as well. Right, so that to me, you could you could get it in one fork or you get it in two forks together. So you know, in general, this makes so much intuitive sense because when you look at what we are, when you look at how we are we are made, then some people will say we are made of molecules. Some people but, say, oh, let's go down further. I know atoms, and let's but, go down further. We are merely you know electromagnetic waves, and the universe. Yes. All the stuff in the background that you have is made of, uh, you know, electro. So if we are just walking, talking waves, it stands to reason that waves and sound can heal us. Absolutely. We're, I like to say, this is science. We are, we live in a vibrational universe in a vibrational field. The word quantum means to quantify those vibrations, right? And every aspect of us is vibrational. And I like to say that consciousness itself is our relationship to vibration, right? So, uh, and if you look at the, the, the research, you'll find all kinds of vibrational terms like oscillating neural networks and things like that, you know, or vibrating microtubule passages. Uh, in other words, they're constantly using vibrational terms to quantify and understand us better. So I like to say vibration is the medicine of the future, really, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's here now but it's going to continue uh, to get more and more profound. You know, I do have to say that um, I practice meditation. I have a meditation routine. And it's a very well-known phenomenon that when two people meditate in the same room, it's not the same as one person or three or four. That's now, right. some people would be cynical and say, oh, it's because the presence of the other reminds you to go back to center. However, I actually was fortunate enough to meditate with 4,000 people in a big dome. And I can tell you that it's far more than just that. So there's constructive interference, obviously. Yes, absolutely. It works the other way around, too. If you're, if you're, if you're with somebody like this, yes. uh, yeah. if you're not centered, if you don't know, it's like in a choir, if you don't know the right tone, you tend to go to the other and you get, you get pulled in. Uh, but again, the more people who, and by the way, congratulations on meditating because that's my main message to everybody. The research on it is just amazing. Uh, and in this time of COVID, not to meditate and take, it's crazy not to do that. The, the, the form could be whatever you want, but the, you have to meditate. You have to come to this place where you're still inside, you know, and you can pull your, you can tune yourself. Meditation is a form of tuning yourself. You know, and but what you do for yourself biochemically is just, you know, it, it's it's it, you couldn't ever get it in a pill, never. Now we are talking here, and some of our viewers may say, "Well, it sounds a little far-fetched to me," but I know that there is solid research supporting the usage of tuning for for healing. Can you talk about all of that a little bit, please? Well, my, my original research, remember, was done what we came phenomenologically. I used my own self in the chain. I kept notes. I tried different sounds. I see. I would notate what they did to me, how it changed my world. And then in 2000, uh, after 9-1-1, a group of Wall Street investors approached me, uh, and they want to do research uh, on herbs. And 
which also I said I would do, but I wanted access to their laboratory. Um, and when I got in the laboratory, I had access to these machines and scientists who could work with a, with a molecule called nitric oxide. Uh, it's one nitrogen, one oxygen that's bound together as a gas that comes in your immune system. It's emitted through into your immune cells, your neuronal tissue, right, and your endothelial or your heart tissue. And this gas is rising and falling rhythmically. It cycles, like every three minutes it rises, every three minutes it falls. And when it's expanding, it's causing your, your, your cells relax, they get further apart, right? They, they have a sense of uh, being able to detox. They can release toxins, the cell walls thin. When it contracts, when the gas contracts or stops to expand, the cells come closer together they get more active and movement and they emit the mitochondria and so on, you emit more energy. When that cycle was interrupted, when it's flatlined, we like to say, is the precursor to every, most every disease you can think of. Heart disease, autoimmune disease, uh, you know, sexual dysfunction, depression, uh, digestive disorders, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, that you can you can Google any of these things and this flatlining this, this this gas is always a precursor. So I had the ability to take tuning forks and tissue and put the forks on the tissue and see that there was we could see there was no it's a graph so healthy tissue would be like this right it'd be emitting this gas whereas unhealthy tissues like like this, and that's that. You may not know it, but over a period of time, if this isn't corrected, you could suffer. It could it could transform into heart disease, autoimmune disease, and so on. It's not good to have that happen. And so, basically, the moment we put the tuning forks on the tissue, immediately, you saw this wave come like this. Immediately, we could do it with the herbs, but we'd have to liquefy them and then make them into basically an essence and squirt them into a petri dish and it would probably take an hour to two hours for the tissues to begin to move. But sound was instantaneous. And the biochemists couldn't believe it. In fact, they, they flipped out. This, this can't be, we did something wrong. We had to do this experiment in two labs, three times until they finally admitted that this was the case. That sounds incredible and in fact, I'm going to take the liberty to jump ahead a little bit in your book. You mentioned it, and I was completely fascinated by it because nitric oxide, of course, is is at the center of almost all, uh, you know, advanced healing, you know, discussion, you know, these days. You said that you used a certain frequency, which I believe was the, uh, you know, auto one twenty eight. Yes. And so, and would it make sense for, you know, a person, any person? to get that specific fork and start using it right away? And if so, how frequently and when and how long for? Well, actually, there's, there's two, the, my system is really three. Is This is the auto-128. We did the original research. But actually, if you were to say, take this 20 fork and this one, the numbers two, this is 384, this is 256. If you subtract the 256 from 384, you get auto one, you get 128. So even when you're doing this, in between, you're getting the 128, and you can get it this way directly, and it's still making another C and G also within here, the ratio. So yeah, this was designed to put directly in the body, right, because it vibrates strongly, points and so on. And this was designed primarily to hold for meditation like this, you know, or tap, and you can move your body and do a moving, like a Tai Chi, Qigong meditation. But all three work as a, as a system, depending on how you want to deliver the sound. But if the 128 has been shown to create the, the nitric you know, oxide, wait, why wouldn't you, again, I'm asking a simpleton type yep. question, but that's the whole point. Why wouldn't you just, take the 128, use it, and good at least, you know, with nitric oxide. Why do you need the three, you know, the 256 and the 384 as well? 
Yeah, yeah. I think it's just, well, actually, the truth is you don't, you can just use one of them, you'll be fine. Right. But I like different delivery systems, especially if I'm doing sessions with people. Right. And especially, for example, if I tap them like this and hold them in my ears, I can just wake up, meditate, have a good thought. I usually tell people do it once in the morning, once at night. And there's something about it hitting the ears and it and when it hits your skin, it stimulates the mechanical receptors and all the ear acupuncture points as well. Uh, and I just like this delivery mechanism, whereas I could take this and press the points, it would do the same thing. It's just a different way of doing it. I could also be more specific. Yeah. This one comes at you in space. So the, yeah, in space. What, yeah, this one comes at you yeah, exactly. like this. You put it on your heart. It's unbelievable for just a meditation, and you can you just meditate on it. But also, the, when you start putting it on your body, you can't use this if you have a pacemaker. In other words, there's a little more precaution you want to take when you press to the physical body. It's much, much, you know, easier just to tap and do this. Um, so, but they all three together, they give three different mechanisms of introducing sound to your system. Again, I would be jumping ahead here, but I just can't not ask the question. Okay. so. I will admit that when I read your book, I jumped and I bought, you know, the 128 and it's on its way, it's coming. Right. But I want to buy the 384 and the 256 for what you just said. Where would I buy it on Amazon or is it, what, what's the best way to get it? Well, I think just off our, our website, it's, it's Biosonics. My, my company is Biosonics.com, right? And uh, there's, you know, we do, you know, we do a lot of business around the world. Uh, so it's very easy just to go to biosonics.com and uh, you can look at our beginner package, which is just the three of these uh, and a book. The book has helped you, I think. And I have lots of videos. I have lots of free videos. I have lots of demonstration videos. And, and, you know, this is, I have over 45 years of material to support what I'm saying, uh, both intuitively and scientifically so um can you you know the vagus nerve has yeah. been very much in discussion of course it's very key can you talk a little bit about when we tune how it affects you know the vagus nerve well i think actually the, the longer i get involved in this i think that's the primary nerve that we're working with uh and in fact you know the medical profession now actually makes vagal tuners they they, they, they implant a, like a a vibrational machine uh, right here, right? And it hits, it attaches to the vagus nerve, which comes from all the way down like this, from, from your head clear down to your gut. And so when, at first they did it for epilepsy, but now they do it for most everything you can think of, because when the vagus nerve goes, it's, it's the one that goes out of tune and shakes, that's when your, your, your digestion can go out, right? Your heart can, can, can get arrhythmic, you can get headaches, you can, it goes, you get epilepsy. Uh, so whenever you, the vagus nerve starts to go out of tune, it automatically goes bzz, bzz, like that. And, it, and it's sort of a high tech way of tuning. Uh, so they understand that from their perspective. Uh, I just have taken and made it more into the, the, taken the ancient perspective and modernized it and made it low tech, something everybody can do every day. Uh, and, and so I actually have my website, uh, Vegas protocols that you could use, but if you just do this and tap and meditate, you're tuning your vagus nerve, uh, because right here in your ears, uh, a, a branch of the vagus nerve called Arnold's nerve is being stimulated by the sound. So you're immediately, that vibration is immediately going directly to the core of your brain, um, and tuning the vagus nerve. So you could, you could also do the tune the vagus nerve, so you know if I back up a little bit. If you put the tuning fork on your tummy here, this is what's good, this fork, you can could, you could go here, press, 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 different places. That gets the vagus nerve at its negative pole, its positive pole, and so on. So there's many ways to work with the vagus, um, you know, and all of them are really good, in fact. Uh, that's why I came out with Vegas protocols to, with people have the forks to show different ways of doing it. 
Thanks for joining me today. Click the subscribe button for more video. Got a question or comment? I love questions and comments. Leave yours below. And here's another video you've got to see.